Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank you for having me here. And if I'm talking too loud, please let, uh, let me know. <laughs> if you have any questions as I'm going along, please ask your questions right away so that uh, you don't lose your question and I don't have to try to answer all of them at once. The reason I wrote my book is because it is difficult uh, to find a full accounting of what um, a military career might look like when someone's battling discrimination or sexism or some other, some other form of discrimination. So we all know that discrimination is everywhere, but it's difficult to find because every time someone files a discrimination complaint, the odds are very great that that complaint's not going to be substantiated. In the civilian world, only 1% of discrimination complaints that are filed actually go to court and get adjudicated in their favor. 14% actually go to, go to trial, and only 1% of those actually get adjudicated. The others are settled or dismissed or whatever. The numbers aren't much different in the military, and I'm going to talk to you about what happened in the 1980s uh, as we go along. I'll talk about some of the experiences I had in the, uh, in the military. But I wanted to give, at least I wanted to be able to show somewhere that this is what a career looks like when you're doing what Arthur Ashe said was having a second job. Arthur Ashe said uh, being a black man is like having a second job because you've got to do the regular stuff that you do and then deal with the racism on top of that. It's not true for everybody, but for a, a large percentage of people that's true. Now, the title of this talk is From Adversity to Diversity to Uncertainty. Uh, starting in 1919, there was a huge backlash against minorities in the, uh, in the country, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, to the anxious summer of 2019, I don't know what the uh, summer of 2019 is going to give us, but all of the signs are indicating that we're going to have some problems. When you have the uh, Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces advocating violence, advocating for people to violate the law and saying that he will pardon them or pay the legal fees or whatever. That's a cause for concern. Colin Powell's 40-70 uh, uh, rule is relevant here. He said he can make a decision with just 30% of the information. Uh, ideally, yeah, 40% to 70%. If you have less than uh, 40%, you may not have enough information to decide what the right course of action is. You have to rely on gut instinct and past performance of your enemy or whatever, or whatever the particular problem is. If you wait too long, if you wait till you've got more than 70%, you're gonna, going to be overtaken by events. So I'm using the, the 40 70 rule to say that I'm concerned about the direction that this country is heading in. Where were we in 1919? Well, 1919 was a difficult period for the country. We were having uh, race riots, and in essence, a race riot was white citizens and military attacking black citizens. In 1919, waiters uh, very near the White House were being pulled out of restaurants. Negro waiters were being pulled out and beaten by sailors and Marines and civilians and soldiers and what have you. Uh, the, the worst violence was in Helene, Arkansas, where hundreds of people were killed. Many of them never found. They just threw them in the woods and shot them down where they were found. And this was all based on trumped up uh, uh, attacks by black people on white people, which were used to justify the violence. We were becoming more isolationist and uh, uh, anti-immigrant. Uh, the backlash against the gains of minorities was particularly strong for returning veterans from World War I. Uh, the same thing happened in World War II because these men had been over fighting in France and other places and they were wearing the uniform of the United States, they were being treated like soldiers and having relations with French women supposedly and we, the uh, country, particularly in the South, had to decide that we have to put these people back in their place. We don't want them getting any ideas that this democracy stuff applies to them. Uh, President Woodrow Wilson refused to speak out against the racial violence. He was getting telegraphs from concerned citizens, from the NAACP, from lots of organizations, and he would not address the violence. He was um, the president who segregated the federal offices in uh, Washington, D.C. He's also the president that screened Birth of a Nation uh, at the White House in 1915. And he said that you know, it's like riding with lightning, and it's all true. So he had particular ideas about, you know, uh, race relations that carried through uh, his organization. When the leader at the top sets the tone, that tone trickles down to the, uh, the people lower in level. All of these military leaders will tell you, you have to set the right tone. You, you come in and you set the right tone. 
You, you set the limits and the parameters of behavior and performance, and people will fall in line. That's been true as long as we've had uh, military. In 1919, the Navy banned the enlistment of uh, black sailors. They decided they would go with uh, colonial subjects, Philippine sailors, uh, South Asian sailors, because they were more manageable than the uh, black sailors. That didn't change until 1933. 